Oh, you okay? Okay. Well, thank you, everyone. And uh, it's a beautiful morning here in Tasmania. And uh, I hope that this COP, for those of you who can attend, is successful because it's a critical one. But just to give some context, the um, United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, the conference of the parties, we're up to number 25. It's a two-week extravaganza. The first week... Uh, there's someone, there's a lot of background noise for some reason. Um, Alana, Alana, okay, thank you. Um, so the cops go for two weeks. The first week is the negotiation of the bureaucrats and then over the middle weekend there's often a lot of NGO activity and then the second week is the ministerial week when decisions are made. So when you go to the COP depends on whether you can afford to be there the two weeks and what your intention is in going to the COP. Are you there to participate in uh, awareness raising or engagement or are you there to try to influence the negotiations? That will depend when you actually go. The second point I'd like to make is that whilst uh, the NGO community and the Greens approach COPs as trying to find global solutions, almost exclusively every national delegation goes with its first priority as national sovereignty. They want to make sure that whatever is decided does not adversely in their own view affect them and unfortunately that means the countries that have uh, huge fossil fuel industries like Australia, like the Saudis, like the Russians uh, in the umbrella group, uh, they um, are there to slow everything down. You shouldn't assume by going to the COP that everybody is coming with the same intention. 25,000 odd people were supposed to be in Santiago. Whether that number will turn up in Madrid uh, because of the changed arrangements is hard to say. But with that number of people, you have to have a very clear view of why you are there. It is best uh, to try and make arrangements before you get to the venue, before you get to Madrid, but to identify which stakeholders you would like to meet or talk with and try to contact them beforehand and often find out where they are staying or make an arrangement to meet at a specific point. Because as you can appreciate, somewhere that is uh, hosting 25,000 people, it's going to be very hard to just randomly find the person you want to speak to. The second uh, point I'd like to make is that not everybody has the same level of access to every part of the conference of the parties. So the people who are there on, on government delegations have a particular kind of pass that enables those people to get onto the floor of the negotiations and, of course, meet with the other negotiators. Most NGOs, including the Global Greens, of course, do not have that ministerial or government pass. And as a result, NGOs are excluded, the people with those passes are excluded from the actual negotiations. And this is important for the role of the Greens that I'll get to in a moment. The other aspect of the COP is it's turned into what some people call a trade fair, others call a circus, quite apart from the negotiations. It has almost become um, a siloed process, as in the government negotiators are busy negotiating the actual text and the decisions. Then there is a massive trade hall where every you know, solar and renewable energy and energy efficiency and battery business uh, is there to showcase what they are actually doing. Then you have other organisations there to push their own barrows. So the Carbon Capture and Storage Institute will be there big time to try and push carbon capture and storage. Then you've got things like the Minerals Council of Australia there to undermine everyone if they possibly can. So there's a huge pavilion of uh, booths where people are giving out good information, 
and you can go there and meet a lot of very interesting people and pick up a lot of uh, good information. There are also in that huge pavilion and in the NGO area, lots of panels and talks going on. You can, if you think about it early enough, and it may be possible now with Madrid, with people pulling out of panels because they're not going to Santiago, to consider whether you might put yourself forward as a panel speaker in some of those. So just work out how can you best participate? Why are you going? Uh, are you there to influence the negotiations? Are you there to become better informed? Are you there to negotiate with the other Greens? Are you there just because you want to learn? Why are you actually at the COP? And what are you doing there if you're on a Global Greens pass? What is the objective of being there as the Global Greens? So which brings me to what's the point of COP25? So. Obviously, it is the implementation of the Paris Agreement that was reached in 2015. And so this is a review of uh, where we are up to, particularly in terms of the adequacy of the commitments that countries have made with their nationally determined contributions. Next year is the official five-year review when, other, when countries are invited to bring more ambitious plans. But this is uh, the follow-up to the Secretary General's United, um, United Nations Conference in New York in September, where he tried to bring countries together to push them to go home and make a more ambitious statement. And that's what he'll be looking for and the world is looking for at this COP, especially given the global climate strike, Extinction Rebellion, the level of civil unrest around the world from young people desperate to get more uh, action on climate. They are calling this summit a climate action uh, COP25. And so people will be looking for serious, much more serious commitments to, to recognise that the move is on globally, particularly for young people. Secondly, there is a review of the Paris rule book, particularly in relation to Article 6, which is the issue um, of uh, the global uh, carbon market. So this was not agreed in the Paris rule book. It's still being negotiated. It wasn't agreed in New York. And it's looking at making sure there's no double counting. If there is a, in this global carbon market, what's going to happen to the clean development mechanism? What's going to happen to existing commitments? And of course, Australia will be negotiating to try and make sure it can carry over its Kyoto credits which uh, I totally oppose and anyone interested in, in uh, achieving a safe climate will also totally oppose. The third big thing on the agenda is the Warsaw International Mechanism, which is uh, very important to least developed countries, small island states. It is on loss and damage. So that goes well beyond adaptation. It goes beyond insurance. It's saying that many of these countries have suffered and are suffering significant loss and damage and need to be uh, to have money put into that. And the second thing that we'll be looking at is the question of uh, leaving with dignity. In other words, it is recognised that no matter what we do now, some, uh, some communities, some countries may not be able to support their existing population. And so because of global warming, and so who is going to take, uh, as the uh, <coughs> Prime Minister of Tuvalu said as early as 2006, who will take my people? So that is a very important, uh, the Warsaw International Mechanism is very important because this is the five-year review. And the, there are two more things I want to say. Finance is always a critical issue at COPS, and this is about the Green Climate Fund. The current pledges are up to 9.7 billion, but it's nowhere near enough. So there'll be quite a lot of pressure on finance, particularly, as I said, from the issue of loss and damage. And the final issue is the gender equality, the inclusion of women and civil society, but women in particular will be looked at at this COP as to how you can better engage women uh, in the, in the, uh, and involve women in the climate task. So my next uh, point quickly is what can the Global Greens do at a COP? Well, I think the key role is because we have a number of Greens, representatives of Green parties who are ministers in governments 
or who are on government delegations. That is the advantage of being a member of the Global Greens because we have people who are actually sitting there on the floor negotiating on behalf of their particular countries, but they're also members of the Global Greens. So the best way that we can engage is to make sure we find ways to meet with those ministers or people on those government delegations, contact them, find out who you can talk to and put your question or put your opinion to them or ask them how you can help them because you might have contacts with your government or other people in the negotiations and you might be able to bring some other countries on board because the UN system is one vote, one value. So Tuvalu has the same voting power as the United States of America, for example. So Every, every country's vote counts in this very significantly. And so using our global networks with those ministerial delegations really matters. The second thing is, um, it is an opportunity for the global Greens to meet one another. It is rare that we have so many Greens passionate about the climate and Green ministers and government members in one place at one time. The European Greens organise a breakfast every time at the COPs and at those breakfasts, it's an opportunity to meet one another. But that is often taken up largely by a briefing um, and a very good briefing at that on the state of the talks. But I really feel the Global Greens need to, uh, it's too late for this COP, but we need to organise a series of events where people who are members of Green parties globally can meet together at specific events. We have had a few in the past, and Kelly, I don't know if there are some organised for this COP, but that is another opportunity to get together and meet other Greens and make those connections. At the Global Greens Conference in Liverpool in 2017, a Global Greens parliamentary network was set up, um, but, and it was co-convened um, by two people um, Elizabeth May from Canada and Kennedy Graham from New Zealand. Unfortunately, Kennedy left the Parliament and left the Greens uh, not long after that. And so Elizabeth's been tied up with elections in Canada. So the Global Greens Parliamentary Network has been fairly inactive, but I think it is an opportunity when you've got so many uh, parliamentarians in one place to at least try to, to convene something around the uh, Global Greens Parliamentarians uh, Network. So thank you very much, happy to take questions. Thank you, Christine. That was really spot on, um, just to get us started. And you raise a good point that what is really remarkable and special about the Greens movement is that we connect people ev everywhere to each other horizontally and vertically. So there are a good number of climate ministers uh, around the world. So I think we should talk about how do we mobilize the grassroots movement to connect with the higher, the ministerial level as well. So good points, uh, leave it to the discussion afterwards to brainstorm around that. Now we move to our next speaker, Alejandro San Martin. Um, and he will tell us about the context, uh, starting from where he is now in Chile and how that can connect to us around the world. So Alejandro, uh, take it away. Hello, do you see me? Do you hear me? All right, you're unmuted. Yep. Yes, we do. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's a beautiful Sunday afternoon here in South Chile, where I am right now. Uh, I will begin uh, because I, I know many of you wonder what is happening right here uh, now. So I will, I will tell you that the, all the unrest that you have heard and seen on television began let's say two weeks ago with a, a rise in the subway fees at the capital of Chile in Santiago. 
so people started to avoid paying and the government respond very violently to it and that sparked the the fire uh, uh, then the, the protest went through the country uh, with we have almost a third of all population waiting marching on the streets uh, for last two weeks uh, so the huge gatherings in almost all principal cities and not only there but small towns had their their, their marches for first time in history so it's very important and significant times for us so uh, what begins with the with that uh, subway fee it, it, it will it has become in eradication of all social uh, uh, justice items that, that that you can you can you can imagine from let's say the 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 principal uh, items that that has been heard are the retirement wages people here in Chile just to 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 say uh, retires uh, most people with less than half someone a third or even a fourth of their income uh, so it's very hard when you when you get to retirement age uh, medication is very expensive way more expensive than any other Latin American country and even in Europe uh, with European countries it's it's expensive uh, education and the whole cost of life has been uh, it's very high here in Chile now so many people uh, the majority of the to pay of uh, all that so uh, that is the the main question of this this unrest uh, where are we right now uh, somehow violence has uh, stepped down a, a little bit uh, there are still marches protests but uh, there most of them um, and there i would say there are two parallel process now one that the government is trying to conduct uh, having a lot of little uh, social councils or something like that uh, to just uh, listen to people what they want what, what are they looking for and the other ones are uh, make up by social uh, by civil society uh, that uh, are looking the same thing but perhaps the the main issue here is that if is it needed a, a constitutional process to have a new constitution in our country the government at this stage is not willing to do that and many social society uh, are pushing for it. Uh, Greens among them, we are going or we are we are, we are defined for a new constitution and a, a constitutional process. So that's where we are. We don't know really uh, which way we'll go. Uh, government is trying to to implement uh, a series of measures, economic measures to ease the, the, the life of common people, uh, but it don't seem it would be enough. So we expect uh, for the next weeks, uh, still a lot of more protest and demonstration, uh, perhaps and hopefully too, uh, to unlock this and, and start a constitutional process that will get to Chile for a new constitution with uh, social justice rights uh, well balanced. So that's the situation. I, I would think you may have several questions. Human rights, of course, is a main issue for us. They, they, they were uh, at, the, at the first weeks uh, of this, uh, some human rights violations. We have military on the streets, we have curfews. So um, it was not an easy situation. It's somehow uh, more normal now. Uh, military, has, military is not on the streets, it's just police now. 
uh, there are some are not curfews or any other measure enforced right now. So uh, even though uh, there are some um, uh, accusations, constitutional accusations in the parliament uh, to point it to the interior minister and the president for the responsibility of the human rights violations. That will take, uh, I'll, I will guess, some months to develop. So that's the situation here on Chile. About COP25, well, as you will, you may uh, think or thought, uh, we are very disappointed uh, that the COP is, is not held uh, here in Chile. Um, and we are having very, very hard time to promote a, a balanced speech or a balanced uh, situation between social justice, a sustainable society, and peace, because almost all things right now here are about social justice and democracy, of course. Uh, so somehow sustainable society, uh, it's, it's so we are very worried about that, and, uh, and we hope we can find a way to put the, um, these topics uh, up in the agenda again. Uh, two weeks ago, uh, we are we were full of, <laughs> of uh, I will not say joy, but uh, uh, we were hopeful that, that the. COP25 will be very useful and, and for our country where uh, uh, big announcements can be held and we don't have that anymore. So uh, we're in the midst of that. Uh, what are the, the, the second question that we had is, is about uh, what global greens uh, could do uh, or what role can be played. I would say that what was told uh, by Christine about a uh, finance mechanism and green funds uh, can be and would, should be a main issue in Madrid right now because we are seeing that we are in trouble that the whole thing of climate change, COPs and everything could be seen uh, as something of rich country issues. So uh, we need uh, to, to put back or, or get perhaps for first times in the, in the table, uh, small countries. Uh, uh, so uh, we can share the the compromises uh, and, and and get uh, a good uh, uh, deal. So uh, that's all that I should say right now. I, I will I will uh, uh, wait for for any question. Thanks so much, Alejandro. Um, yeah, I see a few questions already popping up in the chat box, um, and I'm sure there'll be more uh, when we get to our discussion. It's uh, very concerning all that you have described, um, but uh, let us look forward in the future to re re give, us, give us hope again, reason to hope again, because I think that's why we're here in politics, um, is to actually make our hope become reality. So we will get to that um, at the next step. So here we move to our third speaker, Michael Bloss. And he'll, he is uh, on the delegation for the European Union, uh, for the Greens of the European, uh, the Green Group in the European Parliament. Um, and so we'd like to hear about how he understands his role and how we can work together with him to maximize our effectiveness as a movement. Michael, go right ahead. Okay. Um, hello everyone, um, thank you for
for the invitation. And it's, first of all, I want to say it's, it's really great to, to be in this webinar with all of you from all around the world. Um, I think that is what the, the green experience is, and we are all fighting climate change everywhere. Um, and second, um, I want to say that um, it was very interesting, Alejandro, what you said um, and, and how the, the civil society um, and the protests are going ahead in Chile. I think it's really important to, to see that uh, kind of the social struggle and the climate struggle, they're they are not um, um, disconnected, but they, they have to be together. And I think one of the moves why the, the COP was now cancelled is also to to take away um, global focus on what is happening in Chile. And, and we are trying at least um, also from, from the European Parliament side um, uh, not to look away now, but still kind of really follow um, what is happening and what is especially happening in terms of violence against the protesters. So we're, we're trying to be there um, with you. Um, yeah, um, I was at, in Katowice last year. Um, last year I was still in the delegation of uh, Global Greens. And um, I am now an elected member of the European Parliament. So I'm going there with the delegation of the European Parliament. I'm also inside the, the Green Group in the European Parliament, one of the um, coordinators um, of our Climate Core Group, which is basically uh, well, the group that works on, on the climate campaign and also coordinates the um, climate-related um, parliamentary work of the Greens uh, in the different committees. Um, and. Um, as it was already referred to, there is a different um, um, access badges to, to different meetings. Um, it's, we are also, as from the European Parliament side, we are um, not the negotiators. Um, but as you probably know, the European Union as a whole is a member of the, um, um, of the Paris Agreement. So um, before, the, well, the, before Europe takes a stance, it's all of the different member states that have to come together and, and make the decision and, and put their direction. So the EU actually plays a, a really important role and as it was already um, said also in, in the chat, that currently it's, um, it's, the, it's Finland who, which has the presidency of the EU and in Finland it's the Green Minister who is um, then actually in charge of this. So I think we as Greens also um, have a central role to play in, in what the EU's negotiation position is. And as members of the European Parliament, um, we are uh, there also observing, discussing um, with um, the negotiators, with the people from, from the government side, um, from the Commission side, um, about what they are doing in the negotiations. We, um, as the Parliament, are working currently on our own positioning towards um, the COP um, in which direction we want um, the EU to negotiate. And uh, it is then our role uh, during the negotiations to, um, to make sure that um, what is negotiated is actually what we as a parliament have agreed before, um, but also um, in, in more detail to, to push for the things that um, we believe is now important. And um, um, Christine has already mentioned um, most of the important items on the agenda. Of the COP um, from the EU side, I think um, it's it's really um, the question of um, this um, own well the, the the emission reduction contribution, and um, and we have a debate. I don't know whether you know that we have a new Commission coming in. They make climate a huge topic, um, and they want to well. And there is the debate to increase um, the um, CO2 emission targets. Um, the new incoming um, Commission President Ursula von der Leyen, she said that she wants to increase uh, the emission um, reduction target to um, 50% by 2030, um, which um, is on paper a, a decrease of 10 percent points, but it's in reality only an increase of well, um, five to three um, percent points because we have already reduced so much and already legislation in place. And the other debate is um, that um, she said she wants to move up to reducing 55% if there is um, a, a global um, alliance that goes with her. So um, I think this debate um, will, will be held there. Where is this global alliance? And what is uh, von der Leyen actually talking about when she uh, speaks about the global alliance? There is different kinds of alliances. There is a, 
um, high ambition alliance and the EU is already part of it. So, um, so I think this is one of the, the things that we want to push. But of course, it's also that we um, we will be there also commenting um, for our own national press what is happening and um, and especially I think it's it's the same debate. The, um, the in New York there was um, the uh, the summit and the the United Behind the Science um, document said that if we want to reach a two degree goal, um, we have to increase um, our ambition by threefold. If we want to reach the 1.5 degree goal, we have to um, make it fivefold. Um, and the EU has to increase its, its ambition a lot. And I think this is the message that we have to convey there um, as 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 Greens as as Green. Um, um, from Greens from the EU that uh, the EU always claims uh, to be a climate leader, but um, they are not doing enough and, and they are also not um, a climate leader um, yet because what they have submitted until now is, is absolutely not enough. Um, and then the second question, which you were um, asking all of us uh, speakers, I guess, um, was um, what is what can Greens do there in different roles in different places? How can we as Greens advance um, on this, this global process on climate action? I think it's really, really interesting to see what has happened since one year. I mean, last year we were at the COP um, in, in Katowice. Um, the Greta was there, um, but it was actually the speech she gave at this um, at this um, conference that also sparked uh, this global movement that has now changed so much and it, it's really amazing how much can change in one year so we um, have to maybe be, uh, think about um, what can change in the next year and also as global greens and as greens everywhere in the world we have been fighting for these goals since so long and in this year Finally, we have to say it, it became, at least in some parts of the world, a lot more mainstream. Um, so the question is, um, they like this youth movement has actually achieved something that we as Greens were always fighting for, and that's great um, because it's not about whether you're in the Green Party or not. It's about whether we are able uh, collectively um, to fight um, climate change. So um, I think one important thing is that there is another um, global um, 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 mobilization um, for another global protest and on the 29th of November just before um, the climate conference starts um, and uh, as in the last one in September we saw um, or around four million people in the streets um, in in Europe, millions all over the all over the globe. I think it's important that we as Greens also focus in our localities there and support the movement and mobilize for it and to to again um, and just before the COP um, show this huge global um, sign um, that well the world is standing up and we want now more climate action. Um, I think also um, that it's that it's and um, for for us as 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 global greens or for, uh, maybe interesting to find out how do they communicate uh, globally and um, what do they do well and um, what made them able to mobilize so much what were the communication structures maybe um, we can learn from them but also maybe um, um, we can um, support um, um, them with the experience that the Global Greens has already made in the last um, 20 years that, that they exist. Um, I think this is an in, in, interesting conversation because I see at least, uh, I, well, mostly on, on the global level and with many um, green parties um, in the world being small, but also being very much concerned with the climate crisis, um, that there is a, a convergence of interest here and we can benefit um, a lot um, from each other. Um, I think what is what also is um, really important, um, and uh, Christine already um, um, said that um, on the kind of high policy level, we have. Um, I guess there will be a lot of parliamentarians coming from from many different European um, countries. Uh, green parliamentarians there. That is maybe more the kind of trade fair aspect um, of of the COP. Um, but there will be also ministers. Um, so it it would be good to have a mapping of 
who is there and 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 how to meet and i think not even only like to meet there but also to maybe before we go there inform each other about um, our different agendas what's important what's important in our locality right now because sometimes they are connected sometimes they are connected through the negotiations so it would be good uh, for us to to know what kind of greens in I don't know, Australia, I think it's really important for them right now so that um, that we are aware and also kind of take this into consideration when we speak um, with our own negotiators. <clears throat> I think uh, like the, the other thing what we what we should do there is really uh, again show and showcase um, the global ambition that we as Greens always have that like being green has is never about like kind of only your nation but it's always about um, um global environmental problems that <clears throat> that we can only um, solve collectively and i think it will be um it it, it is amazing that we hear from you alejandro we will now hear from ali and i think um what, what is happening in in your countries and with the climate crisis i think the cop should be used also to to just show and and tell the stories about how the climate crisis already now um, um, affecting people, um, damaging people's lives, and and um, and and tell the stories just to to mobilize people also for the global justice part of 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 the climate justice movement. Um, yeah, that's uh, that's my first thoughts, um, and I'm looking forward to the discussion with you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Michael. Very good points. Um, I especially liked your point about learning from other movements, other actors in the climate movement. In the Global Greens organization, I'd love to receive um, advice, best practices, tips about how we can communicate and network more effectively as Greens. So if you do come across any of you, uh, best practices, just please send them my way. All right, so our next and fourth speaker is uh, Mr. Ali Abdou Bonguer from Niger, and he'll be speaking in French. And after every sentence or every couple sentences, uh, Anne will give a translation to us in English. So uh, fortunately, Ali's microphone just turned on just a few minutes ago. So let's try to unmute it. Uh, bonjour, Monsieur Ali. Est-ce que vous êtes là? Entendez-vous? Est-ce que vous m'entendez? Do others hear me? <laughs> yes. Okay, thank you. Ah, très bien. Bonjour, bonjour. Oui. Um, oui, je suis là, je suis là. Oui, je... Hello, Hello. Hello Annie. Annie. Alors, nous commençons avec euh, votre discours. Euh, Voyez, commencez par vous présenter euh, quel est votre rôle dans la mise en œuvre de, de la COP en Afrique et ensuite, comment est la COP euh, 25 est, est, est envisagée en Niger et en, en Afrique aussi. Um, et qu'est-ce que nous pouvons faire comme un, euh, un mouvement international des, des écologistes? pour travailler ensemble, pour, pour faire la progrès ensemble. Yeah. Um, uh, et nous so avons um, un traducteur pour, uh, pour vous. Uh, alors, vous pouvez faire une pause après chaque phrase pour, pour chaque, lui donner chaque deux, uh, deux, uh, une chance de parler. OK. Chaque deux phrases. Oui, <laughs> oui. Désolée, mais je comprends rien. Donc, bonjour, je suis Ali Abdoubonguer et je suis donc, ça c'est les aléas de la technologie. Donc, c'est Ali I am, I 
am only hearing electronic noises. Sorry, I only heard electronic noises. Yes, me too. Oh, I'm afraid the connection isn't good enough. I, I don't think we can fix it in time, I'm afraid. Okay. I'll... Oops. I'm trying to, all right, I'll communicate with uh, Ali offline um, to try to find a way to fix the connection. So until then, I think we can just move into discussion with the group. Um, I saw that Amy was collecting a few questions. Um, but also, uh, you're welcome to put your questions into the chat box and I'll keep my eye on that. And also there is a hand up or a raise hand icon on your, if you, for me it's when I click the more button, then that's an option. So if you want to speak, then you can raise your hand and then I'll call on you. Like we've just seen Victor do just now. So over, uh, I'll invite Victor to ask his question since he was so fast. Go ahead, Victor, unmute yourself. I I th th thank you very much, Kelly, and uh, good evening from Nairobi to everyone. Uh, it's, uh, it's good that we have uh, this discussion as uh, preparations for the COP get, get into gear. And uh, uh, I just, not really a question, but uh, just to add on what Michael said, that uh, I think it will be an opportunity. I was glad to, I've been with Michael in Katowice in, uh, in, in Poland and just seeing how sharing ideas, how we can uh, benefit from uh, the different uh, ideas from the different regions. Uh, the benefit of Global Greens is that we, we, we are diverse in terms of uh, our regional outreach. So it's always uh, very good to meet and find other Greens so that we can share more. And, uh, I think uh, now that Michael's role also has changed and he's now a member of parliament, I think we, for those of us from the African Greens, mostly I think we may not have many members of parliament in our, in our countries that are from our Green parties. So it will be an opportunity as well to learn, especially from people like Michael, on how uh, we, we, we can engage uh, government and uh, we have uh, engagements with our parliamentarians normally when they have uh, bills to be put through parliament on especially things like climate change and environment. So I think uh, we look forward to an opportunity to meet and engage more as Greens uh, during the sidelines of uh, COP25 in Madrid so that we can see how we can work together and uh, push more on this agenda. Thank you very much. There we go. Thank you, Victor. All right, I don't see any other hands up. Um, Amy, did you collect any questions from earlier on? Uh, yes. Um, I saw that Kai asked um, whether there was any backstory uh, in Spain uh, taking on the role of hosting COP. Um, particularly when it has its own general election in November. I'm not sure if anyone has any more information on that. I would like to say something, Anne. <laughs> Anne, is that in response to that question or is it something? Yes. No, it, it's in response to that question. Um, just because I think that in Spain, um, the, the, the prime minister is, at the moment is very keen to win the elections and he will grab anything that might give him a little bit more credibility. He's um, trying to look very uh, forward-looking, progressive and trying to embrace the green message by hosting 
uh, you know, an international conference rather than by committing himself to really hardline green uh, measures. So I think it's a, a political ploy to gain a few more votes. Sorry. No, it's so, great. Thanks, Anne. Does anybody else have anything to add to that or shall we move on to the next question? Oops. Oh, all right, I think we can move on. I saw Do you guys just Mike, Mike Feinstein, I had one comment on that. Okay. Go ahead, um, Mike. After they chose Spain, I thought, hmm, it makes sense that they went to a Spanish-speaking country. Um, for, I, 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 I was heading to South America like all of you, and I thought they're going to find somewhere else in South America because a lot of the planning has been in Spanish and a lot of the, you know, the, the culture in South America has been preparing for it. So it just seemed to me that that may have also given Spain a little bit of a, um, you know, a little bit of an edge that way as well. So just, just one thought I had about it. Over. All right. Um, an interesting question just came up from Sally. Uh, he wants to know from the speakers what they think would be the optimal and realistic outcomes from this particular COP. Anybody would like to jump on answering that? Uh, Christian, can I have a comment on that? Yeah, go ahead. And then um, Michael after you. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, this co uh, the trouble with the cops is that they're incredibly incremental. There's a tiny move forward in some areas, and then at the end, there's massive congratulations and applause in the middle of the night when finally on the last night at two o'clock in the morning or something, they achieve some breakthrough and there's an enormous amount of self-congratulation. And this is why young people from around the world, and not just young people, because I tend to be in this category as well, are getting fed up with the fact that these cops have been going for 25 years, emissions are higher than they have ever been in spite of this process, which is why thousands, hundreds of thousands of people are on the streets saying it's just not good enough, incrementalism is over. Secretary General of the UN has recognised that that is a critical point. Um, the former uh, head of the UNFCCC, Christiana Figueres, has also come out and said incrementalism is not enough. So I think this time there is real pressure on the negotiators to come out with something agreed and substantial. Uh, particularly when it comes to green finance, particularly when it comes to, to uh, loss and damage for the, um, the uh, least developed countries and, uh, and small island states, of course. And I feel like if there is not a real step up in terms of the um, commitments, uh, nationally determined contributions, as uh, Michael had said, the EU is looking for um, more countries with high ambition to step forward. If that doesn't happen, I think there is going to be a crisis of credibility for the UN process. And I think they know that. I think they're aware. They're looking at what's happened in Chile. They're looking at Hong Kong. They're looking at Lebanon. All around the world, people are going, enough. Incrementalism is no good. We want radical change. And so I think uh, that it will be weighing heavily on the minds of the negotiators. And if it's not, uh, they will be making a big mistake because uh, people will react very strongly in an adverse way if this is just another minimal shift. Thank you. All right. Michael? Yeah, thank you, um, Christine. Um, I just want to add to this. I think um, we also have to always... Um, at least in this round, differentiate a little bit between kind of the, the technical negotiation part and what we ex expect from them and then kind of the political surrounding. And um, I think what uh, from, the, from the, the technical part, it's what has been left from, uh, from Katowice, it's these um, questions about um, global um, carbon trading, about Article 6. Um, and, and here, like for, for us, it's, it's really important that 
these old um, um, mechanisms um, from the Kyoto uh, time, um, the clean development mechanism, that they are not um, inside the, the new mechanism. Um, I think it, it's really important that what and what has been the problem last time that um, I think Brazil was was blocking um, uh, the the finalization um, of of this negotiation because they wanted to have this what is so called double counting um, so that you um, you are um, counting the emission reduction in your own inventory and then sell it on the global market. Um, so, so that that we will stop that, and it's not happening. Um, so that would be for me uh, uh, a success, um, and I think also a success because like there's a lot of pushes to link um, global carbon markets, um, which I don't think is a good idea anyway. But um, but then if we link the global market, the methodology of 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 the market should be at least um, <laughs> not too bad. Um, and I think, the, and I just want to second what what Christine said from the from the political side. Um, we have heard. I mean, we are currently not on a on a two degree path at all. Um, and the um, idea of the Paris Agreement is that um, we we have we are going on this two degree path, and then it's just like a constant review whether we are holding course. But currently, we are going on the three point two degree path. And there's already voices that are thinking about just shifting um, the start of kind of the Paris Agreement backwards until countries have um, found out how they will and how much they will they will um, um, reduce their emissions. I think that is really really terrible because uh, as climate science shows us, we actually don't have time. If we want to go to the 1.5 degree, we probably will not make it anyway. And and if so, we should be carbon neutral by 2024. So, um, um, so this is, I think, one of the big important political messages that everyone should 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 carry. Like we have to, like these contributions have to come now. Uh, they come, they have to come fast, uh, and they have to be much more ambitious than, than what we saw already. Um, and um, yeah, and there was before a question about um, like. And I said the US not a leader, and um, there was a question about um, Germany, and also Germany, unfortunately, is, uh, is um, uh, not not a leader. Um, that we are in the EU, um, we are not reaching um, our 2020 targets, whereas the US as a whole is is reaching it. Um, and yeah, actually, like Germany had has fallen back. Currently, in the EU, there is something like. A, a review of the national uh, energy and climate plan, where Germany is uh, well, well, Germany is not. Yeah, well, the EU also said that Germany is not yet there where it, where, where it has to be. Um, so that's a pity, um, and that's the reason why uh, we should have a government change soon here, with the Greens being in power, hopefully soon. Um, yeah, and yeah, that that's actually all. I was just wondering if there's more questions here. I don't see them. Yeah, there might be one that you could answer there on um uh Andre has asked um if there's any national government or regional entity um that is doing enough. He said that EU claims to be a climate leader but isn't doing enough. Are there any governments or regional entities that are doing enough? Um, yes, there are, but um, I have to would have to look into what, like, who are now the, the big champions. Um, I think um, Sweden is is doing quite well. Finland now has a, a very um, ambitious um, uh, climate plan by being climate neutral by 2035. Um, there is there is positive examples, but altogether it, it doesn't add up. Also, even in, and we have to say that maybe also a little bit self critical. Uh, in Germany, we are governing in in many uh, states um, and even there we are not able to to achieve our reduction targets of course also because it's most of it is uh, is national legislation um, yeah but we have to become better thanks i see renat has his hand up for a while now renat you can unmute yourself 
can ask your question. Go ahead. Okay. Yes, I, I, I had a question still to Christine. Uh, uh, she said, oh, when we go to the COP, we have this and this person in this and this position. Um, I must say, I, I don't have that information at hand. But I think if something is what G Global Greens can do is create that platform where we at least share. Because sharing personal information in Europe has become difficult. So you have to do it within within an association or with uh, Mr. intranet. Eh? But you need the information from the intranet to, to make your comparisons and and then to push people. I, I don't know I don't know Global Greens well yet, but I, I hope that there is a, a lot of motivation to build such a, a shared plat information platform. Hi, it's Christine here. Um, it's a fantastic point and it's one Greens around the world have been asking for for a long time. But the Global Greens isn't very well financed and we are desperately trying to get Green parties around the world to make a bigger contribution to the Secretariat of the Global Greens, which is the Secretariat for all the Green parties around the planet. Uh, so that we can do better on that uh, sharing of information. But it is critical. We do have on the website a list of all elected Green uh, MPs, right from local government through to uh, national government and uh, in, the, in the case of the uh, European Union. Um, there is a spreadsheet, uh, as Eva has said, of Greens and it's, it's critical that the individual parties keep that updated so that it gets uh, the latest um, people elected and so on. But it, that is a key point of connection for all of us. I can tell you that when I was at the uh, COP in Lima uh, in 2014, I met with the um, members of the European Parliament who were on various national delegations asking them to push back against Australia's double counting because Australia cheats on the accounting on um, forests in particular, land use. And the European parliamentarians came back and said, yes, they're aware of what Australia was doing, but they couldn't do anything about it because Australia would then push back against Poland, which, is, which had similar issues. And then it would have derailed the um, negotiations coming into COP15 in, in Paris. So there are always really difficult uh, issues to be negotiated. But the critical thing is that you get an opportunity to have a face-to-face -face discussion about the issues your country, or you can actually inform the negotiators about what your own country is doing, good or bad, and then they can take that forward, hopefully, in negotiations, because it only takes one negotiator to push back and force the issue. But I'll leave um, Ava or Kelly or uh, uh, Amy to tell you how best to access that spreadsheet. Okay, yeah. yeah because the, I, I counted on the European Greens website, they have a list with voters and I counted up to 25 million green voters in Europe. So I was a bit wondering what that would be globally, but. Yes, we are a huge, uh, one of the fastest growing political movements in the world. Um, and actually we are working on building a new website that will focus on connecting people and helping you to communicate with one another. Um, yeah. So if you want to help us to make that a reality, please donate <laughs> to the Global Greens on like our like website. We say, Europe, Europe has a lot of money, you know, but yeah, the, uh, yeah. the Europeans think that their money is to, has to stay in Europe, which is not the case. Eh? It has to, the objective should be, a, 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 how do you say that, wider mm -hmm. than Europe, to be mm -hmm. fair. Oh, okay. Uh, I see there's a few people with their hands up, um, but we are already over time. Um, and so we're, we face the dilemma of what to do about that. We do have our Facebook event page, which is uh, made for ongoing discussion, actually. And I'll be looking back at that. So if you have a question, please put it into the discussion, you know, um, I guess, forum inside the Facebook event page for this event. 
and then we can get back to you or comment directly uh, beneath your question. Um, but I think we should wrap it up to respect everyone's time and give a big thanks to all of you who are here and especially to the speakers who shared with us their, their knowledge. Um, so uh, with that, I will just uh, close the call and end with a, a virtual round of applause. <laughs> Thank you everyone for your time. Oh, thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you for your global ambition. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Bye. Thanks. Everybody. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye, and bye everyone. Bye. Bye bye. <laughs>